of New York. A very warm welcome to the American Theatre Wing's Working in the Theatre Seminars. I'm Isabel Stevenson, and I'm president of the American Theatre Wing. And once again, we are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. These seminars offer a very rare opportunity to hear discussions of the realities of working in the theater, coming from an extraordinary list of performers, producers, playwrights, directors, designers, press agents, union and guild leaders. And since the wing first introduced these seminars, nearly 1,000 of Broadway's and Off-Broadway's best have been seminar guests. The Wing is founder of the Tony Awards, which are given for distinguished achievement in the theater. However, as many of you know, we are much, much more than the Tony Awards, proud as we are of having established them. But for example, our year-round programs are dedicated to serving the community and the theater. We honor excellence in the theater, and we help to develop new audiences, discriminating audiences, to do this, we have created an audience development program for students. The Introduction to Broadway program, which began only seven years ago, has enabled over 70,000 New York City high school students to attend a Broadway show. And frequently, they meet and question the cast. The majority of the students have not been to a Broadway show ever and also, for the first time, have come to Broadway. And then there's our newest program, Theater in Schools. Here, theater professionals, like those you will meet here today, go directly into the classrooms to work with and talk to students about working in the theater. What is ahead for them as they enter the world of theater? And then, of course, here is the Wing's legendary program, the hospital program, which dates back to World War II and the stage door canteen. And through it, Performers from Broadway, Off-Broadway, and the cabaret world have entertained more than 75,000 patients, nursing homes, veterans hospitals, children's wards, and AIDS centers, all in the New York area, bringing the magic of theater to those who cannot get to the theater itself. We are proud of our history, the work we do, and we are happy to have the wonderful working relationship with the theatrical community that enables us to bring people like today's producing team to you so that they can share with you what it is to work in the theater. We hope that you will enjoy and learn from today's seminar. And today is the production of Ragtime, all the people that have made it possible. These are the people that put their money on the line, and bring you the finished production of this extraordinarily good show that is open 42nd Street to all of us. I'd like you to meet, from my left, from, from your left, Terence McNally, Stephen Flaherty, Garth Drabinsky, Lynn Ahrens, Frank Galati, and John Wilner. And then in, uh, to act as moderator, is our own Ted Chapin, who is a member of the Board of Directors of the American Theatre Wing and President of the Rogers and Hammerstein Corporation. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Isabel. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I think it's, it's surprising how many great American musicals are actually about America, because there are very few that are. Um, most of them are placed in exotic locations or about people and characters who could pro arguably be in any number of places. But I think there's absolutely no doubt about the fact that Ragtime is a musical about America. And I think it's not an accident that it's, a, it's based on a novel that takes place at the turn of the century and it has now morphed into a musical at the end of the century. And uh, I think that's, that's a kind of wonderful book-ended kind of situation to be in. Um, because it's such an American story, I want to ask a first question to the Canadian in the group, Garth Stravinsky, <laughs> the producer, um, whose m m money has gone a long way to making Ragtime what it is. 
Um, I know that Livent, your company, uh, has been around for a number of years, and obviously one of the goals was to create new works of theater from the ground up. So my question to you is, why Ragtime? Well, <clears throat> when the idea was first presented to me to re-examine the book, I hadn't read the book in about 20 some odd years, or certainly I, I guess it was just about 20 years. And uh, I had a chance to quietly sit on a beach, which never happens often, and I reread it, and I was unbelievably uh, impressed with the power of the story again, uh, how much relevance the story has today, and what I thought were the myriad of opportunities to, to musicalize it from the very precise characters that uh, Dr. O had drawn to the events themselves to the the metaphorical direction that Dr. O takes us in the book to its themes and uh, it seemed that it was the perfect uh, answer to what to do after a restoration of Showboat because I was really mired in that period and I felt something very attractive and drawn to it and wanted to explore it even more deeply than, than Showboat got us to explore that period. And uh, it made all the sense of the world to, to move with it. And when you met with Dr. O, um, he had, I, I, I read somewhere that he hadn't had a good experience with the movie, so that he may have been reluctant to have the conversation. Yeah, he was really depressed about the movie um, uh, because the movie only really focused on the story of Cole House Walker. Uh, what it didn't do was deal with the intertwining nature of the three stories, the story of the Wasp family, the Jewish immigrant, and, and the Harlem black man, uh, Cole House Walker, and each of their struggles and, and journeys. And uh, that, to me, was fundamental. I couldn't understand how you could ignore that, in fact, because it was the essence of what made the, show, the, the book so spectacular. And it was my job to convince him to, uh, to have faith that it, it could see another manifestation again uh, if we brought the right constituency to the project. Have, have all of you seen the movie? I've mm -hmm. never seen it. I have now. You have now. <laughs> Frank, did you see yes, it? Yes, I, I saw it when it came out, and then I looked at it again before we began work on the show. And wh what was your, your reaction to well, it? Well, I, I was disappointed in the film. I was disappointed in it when I saw it. I thought the novel was uh, truly a work of art, an extraordinary narrative, uh, 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 interesting because the style of it is so reportorial and restrained. It's not cold, but uh, there are tensions in it that I think allow you to feel very deeply because it's a disciplined narrative. And because of the historical characters, and as Garth says, because of these intertwining uh, uh, forces of action, I thought it was brilliant. But the film seemed to me to, in addition to focusing on um, Cole House Walker Jr. mainly, it seemed to me to sort of not quite know what it was doing in terms of tone. I thought it was, it drifted. And the dialogue, I thought, in the film was very disappointing. It seemed to me, I, you know, we actually have not talked really about the film. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think ever. Uh, but it, the dialogue seemed to me to be very flabby and um, kind of improvisational. It seemed to it seemed to be left up to the actors to um, interact with each other in dialogue. It, there, it, it wasn't terse. It didn't have energy. Uh, so it was disappointing. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I have a confession that when I first saw Ragtime and read how much everybody didn't like the film, I was surprised because I do like the film. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the interesting things that I remember about the film is it was made by Milos Forman, who is yes, not an American. Right. And I'm fascinated by his particular and very, well, particular non-American view of America, because with his movie of Hair as well, it's not the America that mm -hmm. Americans know. Yeah. But it, it's fascinating, and, and I, I have to compliment you because one, one thing I missed when I saw Ragtime in Toronto was the, the relationship between Tata and his daughter. 
because Mandy Patinkin did it in the film, and I confess I've known Mandy for a long time, so of course I had to go see the film, even I didn't like it or not. <laughs> but th there's a, a shot in, in the film of, of Tata and his daughter in an ice cream parlor, sharing a very positive and sort of father-daughter moment. And you, I remember when I saw the film feeling, these guys are going to get through. Whatever happens to them, they're going to get through. And I think it's something that I don't know if it, it may not have influenced you at all, but that is something that I feel now in the show. There's much more of a, of a feeling that Tata is not, you know, that there's a positive side to Tata's story. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we worked on that character a lot, but not because of the film. I mean, we, we really made uh, a decision not to look at the film before we started because you really don't want to be influenced by what somebody else, you know, chose to do with, with the source material. So we didn't look at the film. And, um, didn't you find anything to steal now that you looked at it? <laughs> no, actually, I got scared because I didn't know that in the film Evelyn Nesbitt was in Tata's movie. And, it, you know, she's in our movie, but we didn't know that. So I thought, oh, my God, we'll be sued. But, you know, <laughs> well, you it's be? fine, it's fine. We, it's Don't mention that word. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, what, I, what I think is sort of interesting is that as a filmmaker, I think he chose to, um, he chose the most active of the three stories to put on the screen and I can understand making that choice because you know the Cole House Walker story is is it's it's an outward story it's a man who something terrible happens to him he goes on a rampage he's a very active character and um, in reading the book one of the things that we talked about a lot was um, how to make the other two stories equally as active you know mother's story um, is is a very internal journey from a, a Victorian housewife to a, 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 a self-aware woman of the 20th century. And, and, you know, it's not that she does anything particularly dramatic other than take in a black infant uh, into her home and into her heart. But, and that's, that's a huge action, but, but yet the rest of her journey is very, very subtle and very internal. And, and with Tata, it's sort of the same thing. He doesn't, you know, he goes searching for a life and for j work and for a way to raise his child, but, you know, he doesn't blow up the Morgan Library or anything. So it's, you know, those were harder to, um, to, we to weave in and, and make and give equal weight to, you know, and, and make them equally as interesting and, and as dramatic as, as Cole has the story. So I understand yeah. why he chose to do that. You That's know. neat. Yeah. I want to back up a, a little. So Dr. O is won over by your charms. And you decide, okay, <laughs> right, well, some of us know that. Um, so now you have a musical that you, ha you have something in your mind. And you may not know exactly what it is. You may know precisely what it is. What I knew was I had control of a magnificent asset. But from that point of view, to, to, to be able to find a great musical out of a wonderful story, uh, there needed to be, you know, that confluence of events happening and a merger of, of, of great talent. And um, Was Terrence not the, the next person you went to? Terrence was the first and only person I went to because I had a, an incredible experience with Terrence uh, on Spider-Woman. I got to know him very well. Um, and, and my profound respect for his talent and humanity uh, was very clear to me after the Spider-Woman uh, relationship. And uh, I thought that out of all of the writers who uh, were engaging in writing libretto for musical theater today, uh, that he would be an absolutely fabulous choice to give him the challenge of solving the riddle in first instance of this uh, complex book. And uh, much to my thrill and excitement, um, he r said, I'll, I'll, I'll rise to the challenge if I can and, and, and have a go at it. Um, and uh, that's when it all began. So did you do a, a treatment, or what did, you, what did you do next? Um, well, I told Garth that one, I said, let me reread the, the novel, and I had only reread re about half of it. When <coughs> I thought it really had the passion and size for a musical. I had never seen the film, so it never occurred to me to concentrate on the, never seen the, not having seen the film, I didn't know that that's a way to do it, just to tell the story of Cole House. So to me, the whole challenge of doing it is interweaving the three stories and respecting them, because they all do connect finally, but not until the very end. Uh, and I said I would do a treatment, um, and that if Doctor approved of the, of the treatment, the tonality of it, then I'd be happy to do it. I did not want to be adapting a novel if the novelist was going to go around saying they've changed this, they've done that, because clearly you cannot put all of Ragtime onto st the stage 
it would be longer than Parsifal and the Ring Cycle combined. <laughs> right. um, so it's selecting the right material and telescoping, always respecting the spirit of the novel, which I thought was my biggest uh, assignment. And uh, after we did, I did that, uh, Dr. O said, fine. And so we knew kind of that we had a blueprint to do the show, uh, an approach to this, uh, this large amount of material. And that's when Lynn and Stephen joined forces with me. Uh, but we, it was very important to me that, that Dr. O know the direction it was going in. And then I, then I said, you know, go away. Leave us alone. Well, before you Don't said, look over our shoulder. Before you said yeah. go away, did he have any, any, were there any specific things? I mean, obviously you couldn't, as you just said, you couldn't do the whole thing. You had to pick and choose certain things. Were there any that he said, why did you pick that or why didn't you? Much, much later he would say, I missed this or that. Uh, but at that point he just uh, liked uh, the approach. Yeah, Can yes, I ask, uh, yes. what are the mechanics? Is that normal that when you option a property that's already been published, printed as you did, must you have the approval of the playwright as you go along, of the author? Well, it's, it's, in this case, what was different than Showboat is that he was living. Mm -hmm. and so it makes it more complicated, you uh -huh. know, because you want to pay honor to an author, uh, certainly someone of the stature of, of Edgar Doctorow and what he's contributed to American literature. And I, uh, Terrence and I both were in total agreement of this. If we couldn't make him excited about what we were trying to do and where we were going with the show. What was the point? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go through another an experience that he would feel the same way as he did about the film. That would just mm -hmm. not be there. Life is too short. I want to spend three years and trying to hurt somebody as opposed to elevate them and excite them with, with what we're trying to do. So um, he was given certain you know rights of cons consultation and, 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 and approval in the first instance. Uh, uh, just because it was so relevant to him, this work, and uh, we were happy to give it to him because if there wasn't a consensus, consensus as to direction, if there wasn't a unanimity about it at any time, in any pretty serious way, then you know it, it just would have mm -hmm. fallen apart. I think uh, respect is the key word yeah. in what Garth just mm -hmm. said because it is a novel mm -hmm. that I cared about very deeply, right. and uh, uh, as I cared about uh, Spider Woman. If Manuel Puig had not liked mm -hmm. what we had done with uh, Spider Woman, I would have been it's very. Easy. It's common sense. I would have true. failed somehow. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we were if, you're, if you're not in agreement, then you're, there's something that you're lacking there, mm -hmm. too. Yes, but I, I think that's true, and I think uh, Edgar's involvement and, 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 and permission, notwithstanding, the work itself, I mean, even if, if it was a work that came to us from a an author no longer living. I think your instinct in, was in, to initially mm -hmm. was to honor the work, mm -hmm. yes. not, not just to honor Edgar. That is a factor of his being in the, right. among the quick. Yeah. Right. Right. But because the work itself is, has integrity as a whole, mm -hmm. and because you wanted so much to try to achieve its wholeness, even though it would have to be telescoped, mm -hmm. I think that was the, that was the right. secret yeah. of the, the first move into creating I, I, it. Ragtime, the novel, is never an excuse for writing a musical. It yeah. was the reason for it, sure. uh, which is yeah. so there's a subtle story. difference, but an important one to yes. me. Mm -hmm. And I, I very much, if Ragtime were to be, that wonderful novel would be a wonderful Broadway musical, it, I wanted it to be this one, the one we ended up with. Uh, mm -hmm. And we worked very hard. Uh, there was a real agreement about what we were all in that room to do with Lynn and Stephen, and then Frank and Graziella, and then Garth. Uh, Garth That's as important. A producer. Very shows well, in the work. And, the and you, work. there are shows that that is not true, unfortunately, yeah. and and some successful shows. I think you could say this musical is very successful, but it bears very little resemblance to the tonality of the novel or film or short story it was based on. Where here, I think we really worked to make it seem like a. If the novel could sing, this is how it would sing mm -hmm. and move and dance and. That's what you did. Yeah. Yeah. I want to bring the composer and lyricist into this, because you did something quite extraordinary in finding a composer and lyricist for this property. Well, it's, you know, it really wasn't just for this property. It was the dilemma that, that all producers have today, and that is finding the relationships that will take them through a generation of creating musicals for the theater. Um, and 
And I knew, because I, again, I, I go back to a historical relationship I've had with Hal Prince. And I, it was just yesterday, I was on a plane with him. We were coming back from London after we had opened Showboat there. And, and all through his career, he worked with new composers. That was one of his, his, his landmark uh, contributions uh, were, were new composers. And, and I felt that it was absolutely fundamental if we were going to make a major thrust into the producing of original musical th uh, theater that, that I had to establish new relationships or relationships for the first time with, with a, a group of, of men and women who were going to give me great confidence and I uh, would in turn want to encourage them to, to do hopefully great things. And so, you know, we canvassed uh, an array of possibilities based upon our own investigation as to where the industry was today and who were doing great things or had the potential to transcend into a whole new plateau in their careers. And it was on the basis of Terence's treatment that we were able to encourage a tremendous response from uh, very talented people. But uh, Lynn and Steve were so far you know, beyond where anyone else was when they responded to the treatment, it became so clear to me that, that they were the absolute perfect choice. And I didn't have you know, a, a, a crystal ball on this thing, you know? Uh, and you never know. You never know ultimately if you're making the right choice in any creative, catalytic, you know, involvement. But boy, you know, they were dead on, and and they wanted to work with Terrence, uh, and it was a marriage that seemed to be destined. And well, well, I, you, you made the, you made the right choice. Well, but when you made did they come on board after after Terrence and. After Frank, when, no, before, when after Terrence and before. Yeah, that's after. right. But so you, now but we're putting the pieces together. Right, that's right. right. But you had a choice because I, I believe what you did was you sent something that Terrence had written to a number of composers and lyricists, and they then. I said to all of them, here's a few thousand dollars or whatever, go into a recording room if you're inclined after you've written some songs based upon the inspiration of the treatment and see how it works. Because you know... $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> that was in 1993. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the point is that, you know, the one thing I have also realized, what is, you know, why put people through three years of rigorous artistic creation if they're not going to respect each other and the potential from the very beginning? And that's another thing. And, and, and so this is a good way to find out whether it's really going to work at the beginning or not. Um, and th they... Um, it was a very smart thing to do, but I, I, I preface this by saying you did something bold, because I think you did. Um, I want to ask Lynn and Stephen, you, you knew you were in a competition of sorts, right? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different way of going about things. It's not unprecedented. You know, when you, you go through the history of Broadway musicals, commercial musical theater, and uh, Jerry Herman auditioned for David Merrick to get Hello, Dolly, uh, you know, a young songwriter uh, who had basically done, I believe, one or two early shows before that. Uh, Julie Stein, who was a, a wonderful, uh, popular showbiz tunesmith, but had never done a dramatic work. And there was n nothing to the producers of Gypsy to indicate that. Uh, uh, I understand, auditioned to get the, the job of writing the dramatic score of Gypsy to prove that he could do it. And uh, Lynn and I have written a variety of scores and a variety of styles, but there wasn't, I don't think, um, to most people, something that would indicate that we could work uh, on, a, in a, uh, on, on this type of large scale, and dealing with very dramatic uh, issues, uh, political and social issues, and yet in, in my... Um, my own searching for new projects, I had been looking for something that would be quintessentially American, that would deal with uh, questions about what it is to be American uh, um, and, and the roots of, uh, of American music. And so I had been searching for a very long time with Lynn to find a project that would be able to convey this. And when the opportunity came along to be considered. I said, we're too busy. <laughs> she, she said, we're too busy. And, and, I, was, and I thought, this is the biggest break, or the biggest I opportunity. And it was a wonderful opportunity. And I just dove into it. And I think the, um, the, I'm sorry, Frank, go ahead. No, I just want to, isn't it true that what you, very, what you composed first, what you worked on first, 
remains the first measures of music in it's, the yeah. show. It's interesting. I also call it, call it, you know, what is the key? What is the, the that allows you into the piece? And uh, we were looking at this document, the 60-page document of Terence's that we had been given. And uh, the, the opening stage direction was uh, a little boy standing on the stage watching uh, a black ragtime pianist begin to play. And uh, there was a quote from Doctorow about what the music sounded like, uh, bouquets, small chords. And uh, that imagery and that, um, that stage direction was my way of getting in the piece. And the very first notes of ragtime, which is a piano solo, uh, sort of coming from from the the past uh, to us in the modern day as viewers, uh, th those very notes, the very first notes in the show were the first notes that I wrote in the score, and they're still there. They're still <laughs> there. The first, the, uh, we, we were asked to do, basically, we the, the unprecedented thing I believe in this process of choosing a composer and lyricist was that yes, people have auditioned one at a time in the past. And we were in competition with, I believe, eight or ten other teams. We don't know who they were or how many exactly. We didn't want to know that. But that was somewhat unprecedented. And so we just had this image all over of people all over New York, you know, in <laughs> their living rooms and studios and whatnot, trying to, you know, going through Terrence's <laughs> treatment, you know, number eight or whatever, and, and looking <coughs> for clues into this um, process. But what, what um, we realized immediately upon reading his treatment was that there was a tone that was established. And um, it's interesting to go back. I don't know if you've done it, Terrence, recently, but I recently reread his original treatment. And it really kind of bears no resemblance to the show that's on the stage now, and yet it's all there in some form or another. It's really interesting. All the events are in different order, but the tone is there. And that is what inspired us and I think why we got the job, because we, we knew immediately that we wanted to maintain, as Terrence had in the treatment, some of Dr. O's language, some of his beautiful prose, and weave that into music. So the first thing that we wrote for our audition, if you will, was um, the opening number of Ragtime, which remains uh, pretty much in its original form. Three out of the four songs that uh, Stephen Lynn wrote and, and were recorded are in the show. Three out of four, which is Was that brought to Garth or to Frank? At which point? Uh, was no, that? no. Was still this Frank's not involved. Frank no, Frank, I'm, right. I'm no, he's in Chicago. Directing plays of parlor in Chicago. Directing plays. I love it. But I wanted to ask Terrence, um, this 60-page treatment, as you mm -hmm. did it, clearly part of what you were doing was, was to visualize if you can visualize music, but what what huh. whoever this somebody uh, well, it, you know is would give you. Yeah. Um, let me say a couple of things. One, I think what was really unprecedented about this, I'm a great believer in audition. I'm a playwright. And every great actor I've ever worked with has been willing to audition for a role. So, number one. So everyone says, this is so unprecedented. People, friends of mine said, you're writing a treatment for a musical? I thought it was 90 pages. It was only 60. It felt like 90. <laughs> <laughs> I only got paid, very I got paid $1,000, too. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it makes perfect sense. Why do I want to work on this show if Garth and... And Doctor, who has some f approval up in heaven, doesn't like it, then, you know, right. then I said to Garth, this is a great idea. I don't want to work with people who don't hear the same. I hear the music, though I can't write it. But the unprecedented thing was, when I heard the scores, I didn't know who'd written any of the music. I know Lynn and Steve a little bit off stage. We'd met once or twice. I had admired their first three shows enormously. If I had listened to the cassette saying, this is by Lynn and Steve, I would have wanted to like it. Mm -hmm. If you hear, say, here's a new song by Irving Berlin, and here's one by Joe Blow, you're going to tend to want to like the Irving Berlin. So I was glad when it was over. I said, Garth, the only composer, lyricist, whether it's one person, two people, I want to work with, the only one that hears the same show I hear is number four. And he said, Dr. O said the same thing, and I feel the same thing. How then we opened the envelope, and it was Lynn and Stephen, which made me happy that they weren't people in real life, I loathed and had a few You know, like my worst enemy. But I said, these oh people God. hear what I heard, and I can't articulate it in notes. But I, and that's what I was trying to, I was trying to set a trap, or not that sounds bad, mm. a lure, you know, a lure set to a make them bite the right way. And it's so interesting, they chose, like, the hardest stuff, the opening, mm -hmm. the death of Sarah. So many other people chose 
little pastiche things. And like they weren't, I said, these people, I said, whoever wrote number three, it's very talented, but they show no commitment or passion. You know, I really went to bat. I wrote a whole treatment. The only people I'm hearing that really wrote a real song, a couple of real songs, are these. And that's why I wanted them, too. And mm -hmm. so all of this is unprecedented. It shouldn't be. It's common sense. You work, mm -hmm. theater is collaboration. And if you're not singing from the same chart, you're going to have mm -hmm. chaos. You're going to have a 12-tone musical, mm -hmm. which um, no one wants to hear. Particularly Mozart, the musical. with this, <laughs> 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 particularly with this, with this um, material, too, I think, because there are so many ways to go with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so personal. And it's right. so personal. Because when I read it, <laughs> I thought the main character, of course, was younger brother, right. I say. Lynn, mother. I, it was mother. <laughs> a friend know. of mine who teaches the book said, well, who's playing father was the first question. I said, father? Well, that's the main role. It's, you know, <laughs> and everyone sees the story yeah. totally from their point of view. And uh, that's why it's so rich and universal. But. It was interesting. And then I w was responding to Cole House. And then Garth was responding to the character of Tata. 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 I'm Jewish immigrant. The, right. the so now immigrant. everybody's on board. The agents have come in and they've signed the contracts and the agreements. Now, <laughs> now <laughs> what happened? That's your next show. Well, we, we we're, we're about ready for Frank, though. Yes. I, yeah. Think. Yeah. Um, I would love to ask you who the others of the teams are, but that's not uh, no. fair. However, are any of the other people people that you're working with? Uh, they are people that we will work with. Okay. Fair and, enough. And, and to my point, though, about staying with teams through hopefully a generation, nobody could want to work with this assemblage of genii more than I do again. You know, I mean, the thing that I think you, you will garner, I hope, at the end of this, I may be saying this too much in advance, is that there was an incredible harmony created with this constituency. I wish Graziella were here today as well, but, and, 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 and it was, that's, so much the key to success in musical theater. You need harmony in the evolutionary phase of a work being created for the stage. And it's so hard to create that harmony. And it's all based upon the essential ingredients being the constituency. It's interesting, uh, on this platform a couple of days ago, somebody made a differentiation between collaboration and decision by committee saying that mm -hmm. the musical theater is collaboration. It is not decisions by, by committee. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of what, we, what you're saying. You have, to, you have to trust each other and have a group that works. Totally. In and, and you know, you need to have the confidence to engage in, in a rigorous artistic debate and, 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 and discussion and, and push people to really emphatically support a position. And when they're really able to, to, to demonstrably and clearly enunciate their reasons why they want to to take that position, then you better give it some pretty good consideration. And those are the type of relationships that create, I think, great art. The, the best idea wins. Frank, how did you get into this? You were in Chicago in the pizza parlor. I was in Chicago. Right. Not in the pizza parlor. That was his comment. Oh, I was deep that. dish. It was no, deep I was they got it here papers. now, too. It's not as special <laughs> anymore. <laughs> no, I said I was grading papers. Uh, Garth and I had talked. Uh, briefly about my participating in a, a workshop of another show in Toronto and it didn't feel right to me and I was critical of the material that he gave me and I was afraid when I responded to it that I would probably never hear from him again because I thought I was a little harsh. Uh, but uh, af sometime after that I did hear from him again and it was to consider the notion of ragtime as a musical. When I first heard the idea, I thought, my God, what a brilliant idea. You know, I mean, that's a kind of fundamental thing, too. I mean, the instant you hear it, the instant you hear the title, and you, th you think, ragtime. Well, it's a musical form, for one thing. It's a story with sweep and emotion and a panorama. And it's a story about destiny in America. It's big and it sings. Uh, so it just, it seemed like a fantastic idea. And then I was given Terence's treatment, and when I read it, again, it's, we're all s saying the same thing, and, and it's, we've, we've come into this with different points of view, but we really have created, I think, together, I'm happy to say, a unified vision. I mean, when I read Terence's treatment, it was as if a bell rang. I mean, from the very first words of it, I realized, oh my God, he isn't going to contort or, or uh, distill in some artificial way 
this great work, he really is going to let it, I mean, just the eloquence with which you said you want to find out what the novel feels like when it sings. Mm -hmm. And that narrative itself was such an important part of the way in which the story was going to be constituted. That is to say, it wasn't just going to be a series of scenes and songs that were going to move the action, but that Terence was going to have the courage to embrace Dr. Rowe's prose and to allow the kind of energy that you can get when you speak a sentence that goes a great distance to have time on stage. You know, in 1902, Father built a house at the crest of the Broadview Avenue Hill in New Rochelle, New York, and it seemed for some years thereafter that all the family's days would be warm and fair. I mean, that was the first line of the treatment, and that is the first line of the show. It's the first line of the novel, and what's better? His first <laughs> notes. No, his first, first notes. notes. Yeah. So his first notes, absolutely. So uh, the, the, the fact that narration was going to be an important part of, this, of the storytelling energy <clears throat> was crucial to my heart personally, as I read the story. And, and, and also, if I can interrupt, uh, also uh, the, the narrative device was something that Lynn and I uh, grabbed onto uh, as songwriters, because we realized that there were um, ways that we as musical dramatists could take uh, the device uh, that Terence had started and weave it into the score. So songs like uh, He Wanted to Say, which is a song that Emma Goldman sings in Act Two, about all the passions and ideas inside the character of younger brother that he's unable to express. So she winds up narrating his story. Uh, in Act One, uh, in the night that Goldman spoke at Union Square, uh, he, he, younger brother, narrates uh, Emma Goldman's section of the story. And the idea of uh, other characters telling parts of uh, uh, various other characters' stories and, and, and setting the narration to music, that was something that we really tried to, to weave throughout musically. Yeah, and in many ways, uh, in addition to the other things that we've already said, Ragtime is about story. You know, mm -hmm. It's about the way story heals. Mm -hmm. It's about the way story allows us to live, to bring generations into the living experience of, of, our, of our history and our lives. So that even in, even in a, a song like Your Daddy's Son, which is not narrative in a kind of direct audience narrator relationship. It's a mother telling the story of the turbulent birth of the child in the form of a lullaby. And by so doing, Sarah, in singing of that uh, tortured and turbulent event, the breakup of her love and relationship with Kohlhaus and the, 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 the brutal uh, birth of this baby, by telling this story, this lullaby, she heals herself. She's able to live. And the audience is also able to gain access to her heart and root for her and see that she's a heroic figure and, and character. And also, I think the child needs the story right. the way the child needs nourishment. And, and a, actually, the, what, what Frank just described is something that's not in the original source material. Yeah, that's there, Sarah is almost a mute character mm -hmm. in the original novel. So uh, to Lynn's credit, she said, you know, I really need to understand this character as an audience member so I can be with her story and so so I can like her and so I can and understand go on her journey with her you know and and there are a lot of the interesting thing about the novel for all of us I think is that there's a lot left unsaid in it that you intuit and that was one of the reasons that it seemed like such a great idea for a musical because you know songs heighten emotion they find the emotional moments and they put them on the stage and they're they're intuitive and you, you read between the lines and you think oh this this young african-american woman must be thinking this at this point but it's not said in the book it just de chronicles what she did uh... and that's true for many of the characters mother too so that was one of the great things that i think we all found in writing the um... the show so no, the novel is cool yeah. Very cool. And, yes. and uh, I think the music and lyrics add a passion to it and yes. humanity. And plus, uh, you know, to me, a novel is a two-dimensional art form. Yes. You know, it's you and your eyes reading this. Mm -hmm. And the minute you stand up and move in space and time, mm -hmm. Sarah cannot be a mute character in right. theater or she would not exist. Uh, right. So we had to flesh her out. But on the other hand, she's not a very verbal character either. That would have been 
wrong. And right. Lynn came up with the perfect solution, Lynn and Stephen, with this lullaby, yes. which was written in rehearsal, which, mm -hmm. again, inspiration of actors. When you have an Audra That's McDonald, right. uh, and you're she's really... sitting there being <laughs> a mute right. character, yeah. you yeah. say, something is wrong. <laughs> she did. Because <laughs> when we first uh, did our first workshop, uh, Sarah didn't sing until Wheels of a Dream. And it was her... her right, that, that's correct. Uh, yeah. She right. half she, of one song. And oh. she's also murdered at the end of the first, first act. act. She didn't appear in act two at all. And, and, so, and, and yet for Audra McDonald, with, no, with virtually no material, to want to be uh, a participant in the workshop, uh, actually the first reading, right. uh, it was incredibly valuable to, to us. And, uh, and she was very open to the process. So we were able to, uh, Lynn and I, to try uh, different things musically. Uh, had, we had this wonderful performer, actress, uh, available to us. And uh, it, it, it really, for me, helped uh, find what the voice of Sarah sounded like. Mm -hmm. Because when I didn't know that. When you got to the workshop, room. where were you at, at the workshop? When did you come in? When, uh, when did they? The, the, first of all, there were readings before there was a workshop. Right. So I, I just want to distinguish between that. We, we did two readings, and then which were each two weeks in length, both at York University. After, mm -hmm. after the first final, first final draft of the musical was actually in our hands and we could put together a cast and, and explore it. Mm -hmm. And by that time, Frank was uh, very much uh, involved now with the process um, so that we all got together at York University in Toronto for two weeks and um, it, was, it was just a breathtaking experience. Because it's so incredible to, to see you know, a scene or scenes read, examined, and then have the authors disperse, work all night, and come back with new pages and new musical material, and have it rehearsed and introduced. Uh, and this went on tirelessly for 10 days. It was so exhilarating, I cannot tell you. And that's when we saw... Who was involved in that for 10 days? All of us here. And then who else would be part of that? This was well, the essential group, I think, and, other and than the cast. And the cast. Right. Because the cast was continually available to us mm -hmm. to interpret. And very, very crucial, I think, this aspect of it. Because the actors and actresses, the singers and dancers, and we were given by Garth the time and the, the forces to do this, were able to commit themselves fully. I mean, we weren't rehearsing. We weren't getting up and walking around. But they were able to you know, give us your absolute, ultimate, best most honest interpretation of this line and this song so we can test it at its best to see whether or not it passes the test. Mm -hmm. And then if something felt like it didn't work, we, we would huddle at the end of the day and, and they would go off and create. I mean, this, this song for Audra that we're talking mm -hmm. about happened in that first, first, in that first sure. reading and it was overnight. It was written yeah. overnight. I'll never forget the morning that Lynn said, come here and look. <laughs> And I looked over her shoulder at the at her uh, computer screen, and she had the lyrics for your daddy's son. As and the, as they scrolled up, I clutched and <laughs> couldn't believe my eyes. And that it had, it, it it's so eloquent, it's so perfectly formed. And there it was after one night. Then Stephen came in and played it. And that afternoon, we said to Audra, "Come here." and sing this for us. That, that, that was actually a wonderful experience great. because Lynn and I had written the song together for the most part in the, in, the, in the room together and then I went off to my lonely little room at the Novotel across the street mm -hmm. trying to work on the arrangement and I kept thinking there's no inspiration in this pink and gray room and so what I did is I brought the song to as far as I could uh, bring it musically and then brought Audra in uh, and, and brought her into the process watching her act and and I was getting so much just uh, as an observer of the performance I said I have a little Walkman here do you mind if I turn this on and uh, and basically I was acting as almost a, 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 a another actor responding to her as if we were playing a scene together and uh, so I was sort of tailoring what the arrangement would become and then uh, by the end of the day we had the song, mm -hmm. which hadn't changed, really hasn't changed a note since then. No, and she sang it for Garth. We asked oh. Garth to come in 
and well, you know, it was one of those once in a lifetime experiences. Mm -hmm. For me, I felt so privileged to just be at the threshold of the room where this was happening. It was a miracle, I thought. All right, right. now we have to move on. Where is the selling come in? What, what do you I have a general the, manager? The, the exact moment of <laughs> when I, the, I was doing, is the, the precisely the moment I had first heard of Ragtime. And I was doing, it was the first 24 hours after the opening of Showboat in New York. And we were doing the quote ads. And I, was, I ran over, it was exactly 24 hours later, I ran over to Garth's hotel, over to the Four Seasons Hotel to take him the quote ads. And we were exhausted. And we were moving the quotes around. And all of a sudden, Garth said, stop and listen. And he put the tape on. And I, I just I had no words. And I left there, and I was soaring. And it was the first time I had heard in years a new musical. And it was, it was a thrilling moment. And about two months later, I went to the reading. Uh, at, at the York, at York, and I remember they were just reading the show, and I saw the train that Tata was was jumping on. I saw it, and it was it was a very exciting moment because it doesn't happen it, that often. Mm -hmm. and part of this is due to to your wisdom, I think, because you were you were able to give them all the opportunities. Did you? know how many music, how many workshops you wanted, or did you follow didn't your Didn't matter. Experience? Didn't matter. I gave them what I thought they, they needed, and uh, which turned out to be two readings. And then everyone felt that it was time to bring um, an even larger acting contingent together to uh, work with Frank and, and Grazi uh, in staging this work. Uh, which we did again in Toronto, this time at the Canadian Opera uh, Center uh, in downtown Toronto. And I think we had uh, six or seven weeks. And whatever I was describing in terms of what was going on during the readings was even more fervent and, and uh, exciting during the workshop stage. And, and once again, the, the, the work kept leaping ahead and, and I knew, we all knew, that by the time we saw three or four performances of this work before an invited audience of some two or three hundred people um, each night, that the emotional connection was being made, that the storytelling was so coherent that the, uh, that the characterization was being fully uh, uh, set out before us and that um, very little had to be done to, to give us the confidence to, to mount a first-class musical. In the business of show business, you said before, as many as they needed, you would give them. Why are you able to give them that much more, have the luxury of giving them that many more workshops, that many more readings, that many more... My, my priorities are quite simply that it's cheaper and clearly much more, I think, appropriate to, to eliminate the pressure from artists in the nurturing what of work. What about cost, though? Well, but the cost, but it's, 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 it's infinitesimal compared to what the costs are of having a show fully mounted in some theatrical state somewhere outside of New York City even with 30 or 25 orchestra members, 60 or 70 backstage people, uh, a whole support s system of, of, of designers and assistant designers and so forth as somebody is arguing the merits of a particular moment of dialogue or, or a musical moment that may go on for days. Mm -hmm. That's in its simplest form and certainly much more complex if there's bigger problems that are apparent. I would rather either stop the work's creation at the workshop stage or reading stage if I see that we can't resolve issues rather than, than going forward and, and putting ourselves through financial and emotional agony in no particular order. 
I, I, I also know. think, I'm sorry, in the creation of uh, the show, I, I think to, to allow yourself to be the most flexible that you can, you know, yeah. because we discovered the show through a series of two readings and through the workshop. And by, um, for, for these uh, two readings in the workshop, uh, it was done with a group of actors and just a double piano <laughs> arrangement. So by being that flexible, that really allowed, I think, uh, the, the, th the three writers to really make bold choices. So in other words, you could see something on a Tuesday. And then if you would get uh, an idea Tuesday night that would be absolutely uh, the opposite way to go, but a very exciting way that you would want to see, that way we could write, uh, the very, we could write it that night or the next morning and see it uh, up in front of an audience the very next day, and we did, uh, we did a lot of that. Where yeah. if you're in production with a 30-piece orchestra, yeah. costumes, it would take you maybe two weeks to put in the same sort Obviously, of change. Obviously, it, it's very logical, as, as you mm -hmm. described it, Garth, but workshops today are so terribly expensive, the way they're being done, that most producers can't afford to do what you did. But, but what Garth, I think, is saying, they're a bargain compared Absolutely. to trying to rewrite the right. show but I wonder when the why sets are there. Everybody the else didn't. Uh, well, yeah, but it's, I, I should also say the, la the last two musicals that, that Lynn and I have written together mm -hmm. were both done at not-for-profit theaters, and they were both done through a series of readings and workshops. They were done identically to the way uh, Garth uh, produced Ragtime. Mm -hmm. And... Um, for it's me, on a larger it, scale because a it's a larger scale, show and it needs a, you know, a larger I investment, I would assume, but it's the same process. Uh, Economically, uh, it sounds yeah, like it's a very same process. smart I also think what Garth, what Garth is doing it makes great sense to me is the first two workshops were readings. Time, we spent time with Frank and Grazzi for <coughs> material they eventually would put on its feet, but there, we didn't spend hours, get up, mother cross here, the little boy. Right. So when you went to the room, there the actors were sitting there with music stands, and it said in front, mother, tata, the characters' names. So many people do a staged workshop, which costs a lot more money, mm -hmm. and they, we just got the material That's sort right. of right. That's so right. once we went into production, we never made scene eight, scene one, and we made those kind of changes that right. throw a whole production out of the... The show was sort of frozen in a way, other than fine-tuning well, before we did the physical production. Well, in a way, out. but you see, I think one of the other advantages of this process is that the physical production was also in a dialogue relationship with the development of the text, mm -hmm. so that uh, when we got to the actual first staged workshop performance, Eugene Lee, who's the set designer, Santo mm -hmm. Loquasso, the costumes, and Jules Fisher, and Peggy Eisenhower, the lighting. But when Eugene Lee saw the first staged performance, and he and I had already been in conversations about c conceptual ideas and Garth, we had all shared uh, notions about how the show, what the show might look like, and talked about uh, Penn Station and, uh, and so on. But anyway, after that first performance, he said to me, well, you know what? This show really doesn't need any scenery. <laughs> And one of the things that we committed ourselves to as a value was that we were not going to ask Stephen and Lynn to create one single additional measure of music to in order to make these transitions that would bring the dramatic tension between conflicting forces and scenes as close together as possible. So that after you hear the most heartbreaking epithet in the, in the show, the greatest insult that poisons and stenches the air, the very next thing you hear is Sarah coming on singing her lullaby. You cannot interrupt that kind of flow with the trucking of a piece of scenery across the stage or something physical and cumbersome. And Eugene knew that and he understood that. And so uh, much of what he was going to focus on in the aftermath of that workshop was ways in which we could streamline the physical production so that the space itself would be psychological, not scenic, but sort of, you know, with psychological energy, the way Shakespeare's stage is. Mm -hmm. Can be any time and any place and the blink of an eye and the, in the speaking of a line of verse. But the other thing I just want to add is that it was also true that Lynn and Stephen and Terrence were fascinated and turned on, as we, we all were by each other's areas of focus. And I'll, I'll never forget the first time that we looked at the model of the set together. 
-hmm. And we kind of talked through and looked at it and played with it and showed the little things that it could do. And I remember once in the rehearsal room in Toronto, there was a shaft of sunlight one afternoon coming in from the window, and it happened to be falling down onto the little paper model. Mm -hmm. And Lynn and I walked over and looked at it, and there were times when I think some of the things in the, in the writing and in the creation of musical ideas would be a result of sensing what that physical what space could, could feel like. That's right. What it could do. So, <laughs> you see, I mean, it was a dialogue between these various uh, uh, modes of expressiveness. Was it your job then in advertising to convey this to the public, or was it publicity to do that? What is the difference well, between you know, advertising it's, it's a very, and publicity? It's a, it's a responsibility because these very talented people were working on the show for a long time and it's it's the the first step to tell the public is the advertising mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's a responsibility Did you create that uh, actually the the great thing about working on a Garth Drabinsky project is that it's a collaboration and it's a collaboration of of two very talented agencies in Canada, plus our agency in New York. And it's a one team, and along with, with the, the entire company. Um, I don't think that anything is, is one item. It's all, for, it's, it's all how it works together. Uh, but at some point, that has to be brought to the public before they themselves the yes. public do. So how do you do that? And who does that? Well, this is a, we try to get into some part of what it is to produce. Let me, let, let me, let me help John off, take him <laughs> off the hook a little bit here. Um, early on, uh, even prior to the staging of the workshop in Toronto, as I dealt with the creative problems, I had to deal with the marketing problems. And uh, what we did was, obviously every one of these readings we had our agencies at these readings so they began to feel and understand the work early on because they've got to be in that same time link with you or it all falls apart um, and uh, I, I you know we, we, we went into huge briefing exercises um, and my job is to inspire an advertising agency or in this case three of them to bring me ideas, throw tons of ideas at me as to how to solve the problem of getting to the marketplace on a show. And I remember one day that I had just finished a, a, a day at Ellis Island. And the reason I was there was, one, to do the research on the immigrant experience. I wanted to do that very much. But also the architect who did the restoration of Ellis Island, Dick Blinder, was my architect for the theater on 42nd Street. I wanted to see what, what he was doing a few years back. And I came back with 400 videotapes, books, magazines. I get, it, memorable, it didn't matter what I could buy. I just bought everything. I was a great consumer that day. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I brought everyone around the table. I said, look, you've got to see this. Stuff. You have to, I want you to understand it. And I want you to emotionally involve yourself with the immigrants arriving at, at Ellis Island. What does that mean in terms of selling this show? How can you, you know, uh, you know, make that a reality in respect of our marketing? And so they're invited then to go back, study the problem from logo development to image, to, to imagery. Remember, okay. there's no show yet. There's no formal cast. There are no costumes. I don't have the benefit of all of that to work with. I have the name of the show and, and what the story is all about. And that's all. But he's saying also it's an evolving process. I can't tell you how many times over the past 25 years I've been given a script and now do the advertising campaign. Well, it doesn't come from a script. It, it comes from a process of, of, of living the, the show for, for a long period of time. Uh, it, it's, and it, it's all elements of the advertising campaign to entertain the public so that they will come and buy a ticket. Uh, they've done their job. Now it's, it's our turn to, to tell the public. And it's, it's a combination of television and radio and 
uh, newspaper ads and, and outdoor. But the public shouldn't know, well, we saw a sign on the West Side Highway, or we saw a full page ad in the New York Times. The, the ideal is for the public to, to not know exactly where they saw it, but to, to be educated. There is a musical out there, a new musical, that we want to see. And it, it, doesn't come from, it, it doesn't come from any one item. F fundamental to, to all of this was, again, after the workshop, I made a decision very early on that as soon as the workshop was completed, that I wanted a cast album out of this show uh, before it had, had been mounted as a first-class musical. Now, that's been done several times over the years. Lloyd Webber did it with Evita. He did it with Jesus Christ Superstar. Called a concept mm -hmm. album, if you will, back in those days. Um, and the relationship I had with BMG fortunately, uh, was supportive enough and encouraging enough to, s to support this process. And uh, without having an orchestration of the music, again, you can't sell the show on radio, you can't sell it on television, it's just you can't go anywhere with it. And, and, and when I said to Steve, we're going to do an album, and to Lynn, I mean, they were extraordinarily excited by that because it gave them something else, and that was the ability to work with Bill Brown, our orchestrator, and to begin to merge his vision and ideas of the musicalization of the show into the, this complicated process of making it all merge together at the appropriate time. And, and also that by bringing Bill Brown, who's a, a wonderfully talented orchestrator who had uh, just done Showboat uh, for Garth, by bringing him in at that point, I was able to further um, my process, you know, because, you know, how did the world of the Lower East Side sound versus the, the world of Harlem versus the New Rochelle world, all these different types of music that were going to live and combine and connect and bounce off one another. Uh, by bringing Bill in at that point, it wasn't just about making a record to, you know, to sell a couple of tickets. It was, uh, again, part of the process of the writing of the show and the education for all of us of what this show would sound like. And uh, we were able to bring uh, Bill in and uh, the orchestra, have an orchestra read-through session over three days, stop that process. Bill and I could have further discussion. He and I, he and I were actually Siamese twins, you know, for the past, uh, you know, two and a half years, side-by-side uh, -side working on every measure. And we were able to begin our dialogue and uh, work and develop things and then finally go into uh, the recording studio up in... Toronto uh, in July of um, 96. 96. But that was before the production was actually mounted. So this was sort yeah, of your own right. version. I mean, right. part of the workshop right. process. That, this is just, a, well, it was going to sound like the cast album after it had been well, we mounted. Had, we had done it, I, I, I think, about a month. It's, it's, I, I can't believe this as I say this. About a month and a half after we had stopped the workshop. And uh, yet, yet Lynn and I had ideas for new songs. There were four songs on that recording that had never been ever done on stage, but mm -hmm. they seemed like the right songs. And we wouldn't have known that had we not done the workshop. So we, we wrote them, and we just uh, put them on the record. And uh, they're all in the show, mm -hmm. exce except one that has since sort of fallen by the wayside. Where is the cast album sent to? Radio? Television? What? Is it no, the it, it was modern the, it day was, version of the song plugger? No, what? no, it was distributed by, by RCA. It came out coincident, actually in October, of, of 96 before the show opened in Toronto in December. But the orchestral tracks, and well as some of the vocal tracks, became absolutely fundamental in terms of what John and our two Canadian agencies were, were, were dealing with in the, for the purposes of creating the advertising materials for the show. So it was a double purpose I for see. us. And if I could just say something about Bill Brown and the orchestration uh, dimension of this, it was so interesting to me and uh, and moving actually as well that in those rehearsals in the workshop and subsequent rehearsals uh, before the uh, that first Songs from Ragtime album was made, Bill would come and sit in the corner of the rehearsal room and work all day as we rehearsed just being in the room with the actors, 
feeling how the scenes were emerging, what the discussions were like, where the climactic moments were, so that the orchestration, in addition to being a part of the dialogue between all of us, was also a factor of his getting a sense of what the actors were doing and how these scenes were being rehearsed and being shaped. And of course, needless to say, to have the writers with us all the time in, during the rehearsal process meant that they were continually present, continually affirming or questioning what it was that we were doing as, you know, as you rehearse a scene and you work with an actor, what could be more thrilling than to have the creators of the scene there to interact and to help and to question and to evaluate what's going on? I wanted the potential audience to feel the way I felt when I went to that reading. And I wanted the, the potential audience to feel what I felt when I first heard the first ten notes of music, that I wanted more. And that was, I knew that was the way. I wanted the public to want more. And it, it, that was the main goal. Well, then there's the advertising. There's the cast album that you have for selling. All of this before the show is open. Now what happens? Publicity, marketing, do they well, come Can in? I ask a, an interim step? I want to ask about the theater. Where in this process did the idea of building a new theater on 42nd Street to house ragtime, or were they, were they separate ideas that happened to coincide? Yeah, I mean... The, I, the opportunity to build a new theater came in 1995 um, after MTV let an option lapse on the Apollo Lyric Theater and uh, we had put our oar in the water so to speak and said call us the moment they don't exercise that option because we will show you how to build a theater from these two theaters and they failed to exercise the option we went in there now at that time it was still a year and a half before ragtime had opened in Toronto. So we made the decision to, to go ahead with the theater in New York City, uh, irrespective of whether Ragtime was going to work creatively or not. However, it is to be said that if Ragtime was a success in Toronto, what a perfect venue it could be because both of these theaters were built at the turn of the century, uh, at the time that Ragtime was set, and in many ways could reflect a lot of the aesthetic an emotional value of what the show is all about, uh, but it w but it was a decision made totally independent of of the of Ragtime. We needed a venue in New York City, and we needed a venue that could really accommodate musicals of every shape and variety, uh, from a physical standpoint as well as uh, a size that could generate a sufficient gross to allow you to amortize the sub substantial costs of uh, mounting a musical. Now, I want to ask you, I, th I think there's some general confusion <coughs> about exactly what the Ford Center is because it is a brand new theater and yet it, it's, it's two theaters that would have been landmarked at some, in some they, style. They, they each had historical elements uh, and essentially what happened was we took the site plan of both theaters, drew a brand new theater on that site plan and then we had regard to all of the historical elements that had to be retained from those theaters in creating a new environment. And so the historical items were all saved, moved to a warehouse in New Jersey where they were all restored and put back into the new facility in the various architectural, uh, philosophical, you know, way that, that, it, that the, the work was uh, conceived. It was an extraordinary job. I remember walking down 43rd Street and seeing just a facade beautiful brick facade of the Lyric Theater with absolutely nothing behind it. Myself wondering if it was going to topple over, but clearly that didn't happen. You did a remarkable job. All right, job. now is, how is Ragtime doing now at the theater? Well, it's, it's, it's the highest grossing show on Broadway. I guess that's the easiest way I can uh, sum it up. So it's doing very well, and from the audience reaction, which is more important because that determines the long-term duration of a show. How large is the show. theater? How many seats? It's, it's a little over 1,800 seats. 1,800. Yeah. Are you still tinkering with the show? Well, no, we, 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 actually, <laughs> we actually stopped about to. two days <laughs> before, uh, before uh, opening night <laughs> and decided that that was, that was going to be but, it. Well, we've but tinkered with it in Toronto, I've we've tinkered with it in L.A., and we've tinkered with it in New York, and, and we've done major surgery all the way. I want to know if you had all these productions. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. you can just little stuff that yeah. Yeah. doesn't make a huge difference but it does to it the writers and, and yeah and, and well, just better but and, and it's a luxury uh, it, it, 
Yeah. And, and shows and, used to go out of town. I'm sorry, Steve. No, 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 we were we were actually. It was more than just like little tinkering things. I mean, we were we were actually adding new songs, new sequences. At one point, we had one version of Ragtime running. Uh, at the Ford Center in Toronto, and a totally different, well, I shouldn't say a totally different, but substantially different version running uh, at the Schubert Theater in Los Angeles. And, you know, uh, by the time we got to New York, there were other changes. Are, are there any songs that, that, that were cut out along the way that you have a special fondness for that you think might go in that trunk and get used some other place? Side by side by Aaron's and Flaherty, <laughs> well, yeah. I always it works, say. works for some. <laughs> really, I, uh, only one major song was cut. Yeah, so we, you, you know, as you go along writing and you, you sort of we, learn what you're doing a little more, your proportion of cut songs diminishes, or at least yeah. it has we, in we our case. We discarded very little. Not a lot. Everything that we wrote, I think in some form or another, ended up in the show, and even if we wrote a, a melody that or a song that we ended up not using, maybe the bridge remained or something like that. Right. So there really was very little uh, waste. Are the there any lyric did. ideas from Doctor O? Are there any? Oh, it's sure. I mean, all through I mean, some, some of those those sure lyrics that we see on billboards and stuff. Are any of those all yours, or any of those uh, oh. come from? I think those are all mine, but I don't know. You know, I, I sort of lost track at a certain point. There was there's, there's one moment in the show that I I actually couldn't remember whether I had written or he had written. <laughs> and I um, went back to the book and I found the specific scene and it's right after Mother has found the baby and she hears the um, Italian ice men coming and the gardeners coming up the hill, the maids, and, and, she, and it doesn't say how she feels or what she was thinking and I realized that I had filled that blank in. You know, but it, in a ra I, I'm rather proud of it, but, I, but it was my sort of interpreting what she thought at that moment. You know, I never stopped to think they might have lives beyond our lives, and he doesn't go that far. So, you know, it's, it's I have always to go back inspiring. to the nitty-gritty. How much merchandising, how much publicity, how much a does after that the, uh, after Well, that? I can tell you that after the opening of this show, the superlatives <laughs> of the quotes replaced <laughs> the lyrics on the, on the billboards. And we, we, for the first time, we were able to say the superlatives because it was about us rather than us saying it. So for the, for the first time, the advertising campaign shifted to how terrific we were received in New York by the, by the critics all over the country. So that gave us another tool to, to use, an important tool, because before that, it was not our desire to tell people. We wanted to show them how wonderful it was. We couldn't tell them. It's not done. So now we have, we have that tool. Uh, now this time of year, we're we're receiving awards, and, and it's another tool. Uh, what, what the main it? tool, the biggest tool, is the audience, is the 1,800 people coming out night after night, eight times Talking a week, and that is the biggest tool. Telling and all the advertising in the world no. cannot make a, a show that the audiences do not love work. Mm -hmm. It's the audiences, and advertising can make a, a, a wonderful advertising campaign can make a show that's doing well sell out, make a show running three years, run five years. But it's the audiences that, that there are every night that make that show work. I was, was going to ask if there's any, or what, what was the most non-standard publicity kind of thoughts that, that, that you, I know you were at one point, the opening night party on Ellis Island was an idea, which is a kind of a non-standard idea. <laughs> Going to Ellis Island in January well, we seemed like a whole thing. Not a good idea. But <laughs> is there anything that, given the particulars of what this show is, that you thought, well, we could do this that other Broadway shows don't do? I, I'd well, say I'll tell you one of the most emotional uh, experiences we've had uh, that we never could really fully appreciate a year and a half ago uh, happened on Sunday night in Washington, D.C. when. Uh, our the third company of Ragtime opened actually last night, but one could say that it opened on Sunday night because uh, we were blessed to be able to perform the, in, the production in front of the President and First Lady and the Vice President and uh, half the Congress and Cabinet in the, in the U.S., I guess, uh, and, and a lot of other very special people. Um, and it was interesting because in Los Angeles, um, uh, when the review came out, which was wonderful in the L.A. Times, uh, Laurie Weiner, the critic there, quoted uh, President Clinton's inaugural address from 1996, which made a major statement on race relations, and that's when the whole race relations policy of this particular administration began to, to really gear up in a, in a powerful way. And um, 
and we always talked amongst ourselves. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could really finally get the president to see this show because in so many ways it demonstrably depicts uh, the predicament of America today and, and what it says for the next century going forward, or what it can say. And, um, and to see him so moved by the experience and then join us on stage on, on Sunday and talk to that audience after they had seen the show and what he said about the experience of seeing that show, well, that's publicity that you really are really very fortunate. I'm dying to ask Garth if we can use it in a quote ad. <laughs> you must see this show, Bill Clinton. <laughs> right now. It's under negotiation. I, I, <laughs> yes, but who arranged the, the idea of the opening of the show along with the time they were focusing on immigration and the immigration bill coming up and all the all of the importance that being placed to uh, the immigrants in this country, yeah, their, right. their value. Exactly. Their, and, and who knew, you know, when, when we were beginning to develop the show, though we had an inkling that the sort of millennial consciousness was going to become more and more in the atmosphere as we were getting mm -hmm. to, to the opening, we felt, gee, it, you know, this, this could be really interesting. It's, just the turn of the century again, and you know, a few it's years ago. When we, but now, now we realize that this was an uncanny narrative to be telling at mm -hmm. this moment in our what history. What are you planning on next? Can we ask all of you that? Where do you go from Staying here? together. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Let's try. <laughs> Let's try. Right. Why don't you start with Terrence? I'd, I'd like to keep things secret. <laughs> because so many things in the theater, you talk about them, and then a year later you see yourself on television talking about this wonderful play you've written that no one wants to produce. So I wait till the contracts are signed before I talk about stuff. But and you come back and tell it? Yeah. No, after it's opened. <laughs> if you invite me, then I'll come. And what about? Well, we're, we're working on, on a, new, um, a new musical, and uh, we're talking about a, a, a work on a musical film. Mm -hmm. So, Well, I'll, I'll answer the I can say ditto, because we're right, together. Is that it? Yeah, we're, 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 you know, we're you, you working on vacation. Work together. <laughs> you, you never no, work not, not exclusively. Not exclusively. We've done things on our own. We've been working together as a team for 15 years. Though. I remember. It's really our yeah. anniversary. We're little kids. We're, little kids. <laughs> we were young before, were we? Your, your shows are obviously <laughs> called <laughs> Untitled One and Untitled Two. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The fall project and the spring project. Well, I've been working on a screenplay, an adaptation of a Paul Bowles novel called Here to Learn for uh, Harold Ramis. So I'm expecting to spend some time this summer uh, on a second draft of that. <laughs> All right, and now, Garth. Well, we're doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's about. Uh, we have various works in uh, development, and uh, we're doing a, do a, a restoration of Pal Joey, um, uh, which is going to be read in f for the first time this summer. And um, uh, we're mounting a new musical based on the choreographic work of Bob Fosse uh, this summer. Uh, and it will be in, in its full glory, hopefully, in July. And a new musical at Lincoln Center this fall with, uh, with Hal Prince directing and Alfred Urey writing the book. And a young, wonderful uh, composer by the name of Jason Robert Brown doing the music. And, uh, That'll keep us active for at least the next six or nine months, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and w when I'll betray my confidence, but when, when the New York Times did report Pal Joey with Terrence and Frank, so I, I, I'll report that since I read the New York Times. <laughs> don't, be, don't believe everything they say. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. But th that was that. reported, so it's public record, I believe you can say that. But I, I do want to say again, and I, and I think, I, I hope and I know that everyone here feels the same way that uh, it was to be blessed to have these people in one's life for so many of the last years, which is why the theater can be so spectacularly satisfying. And it should only be that way for a long time to come. I also think it's, it's fair to say that having listened to you all this afternoon, it's very clear why Ragtime is as good as it is, because you have all 
form together to make one extraordinary entity, and I congratulate you, certainly. And the designers are part of that yeah, collaboration. Absolutely. Well, every level, next time, yeah, yes. I mean, there, there are every many, we represent many more people. It's, it's funny to talk about Ragtime without Graziella That's and right. Jules yeah, and Peggy and Santo's costumes, which are unparalleled, I think, and yes. sets of Eugene Lee. Yes. And it was in the a, theater, was that's a, what's so great. Who, you can't say who did any moment in Ragtime. Right. And right, we're not right. even talking about the, we haven't talked about the actors except right. for Audra. Right. I mean, what Marin brings to that role, Brian Stokes, uh, yeah. Peter Free, I mean, just, where do you begin? The, that's why these panels always seem only telling a f that much right. of the story. Yes. Yes. <laughs> these are the American Theater Wing seminars that are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And it's the American Theater Wing that brings you these seminars, and I don't know when we've had one that was so full of, of information and the joy of collaboration and the joy of talented people loving and respecting each other and caring so much about the product that they brought forth. And that product is Ragtime, a marvelous show that is making Broadway and 42nd Street one of the most exciting places to be. And thank you so much, the whole producing and creative team of Ragtime, for being with us at the American Theatre Wing Seminar and working in the theatre. Thank you so much. Yeah, but that's been, I saw that on, I saw that on. That's great. I'm going to, I'm definitely going to.